also ask questions. Good, all good. Hello and welcome to the Global Journalism Seminar at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. This week, we have one of the most intrepid, courageous journalists I've ever encountered. I was going to say foolhardy, but I'll leave that to others to decide. Fisaya Soyombo is a Nigerian investigative journalist who was a former managing editor of Sahara Reporters and the pioneer editor of The Cable. He's also edited the International Center for Investigative Journalists, Investigative Reporting, and is currently the founder of the Foundation for Investigative Journalism. Fisayo is a journalist who believes in absolutely throwing himself into whatever story he is working on. He got himself jailed to spend five days in a police cell as a suspect and eight as an inmate in the infamous Ikoyi prison to track corruption in Nigeria's criminal system. He drove the equivalent of a stolen car, a vehicle with no documentation from Abuja to Lagos, passing 86 checkpoints in a journey of 1,600 kilometers over 28 hours, just to see what happened, to see if he would ever be stopped, asked for documentation or arrested. Zaya, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Mira. Good to see you again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your investigation into the Nigerian prison system, because it was quite an extraordinary piece of reporting. How did the story come about? And just tell us how it unfolded. Thank you. Um, like you said, extraordinary piece of reporting, but I did nothing extraordinary at the start. It was a story that began as a lot of stories could have happened. You know, a cousin of mine did bad business, um, got into trouble, his creditors came after him, got him arrested and um, detained momentarily in prison, and he came out and said, oh, wow, there's so much going on in that place. There's so much injustice in that system. And from that moment, this was in 2016 or 15, I started to think someday I might like to report from the factual point of view, not talking to ex-inmates or talking to prison warders. I wanted to find out you know, a report that is indubitable. That's what I wanted to do, which then meant that I had a number of years to get myself ready psychologically, mentally, to go spend time in prison. You know, initially it was meant to be a totally, a holy prison story. In fact, I titled the page Reverse Prison Break because a lot of people in prison want to, you know, organize deal breaks to get out. I wanted to get in. But then I got into the police cell, you know, as, I went with someone to say I bought a car, what 2.8 million naira. I paid 500,000 naira and I didn't pay the balance of 2.3 million. And then the police picked me up. By Nigerian laws, you cannot hold a suspect beyond 24 hours if a court is within 40 kilometers radius of the police cell. If it is more, you can't hold the suspect beyond 14 hours unless you get a court order. These guys detained me day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Every morning they would come to me to ask if there was someone I could call who could pay for my bill. I saw minors in the police cell. You know, I saw bribery, corruption. If you wanted to use your phone, you had to pay. If someone brought you food, you had to pay to be able to eat food that was brought to you by your relatives. Meanwhile, you were a suspect, not a convict. Which explains why when the NSAS protest began in Nigeria in 2020, I, as an individual, supported it because I had first-hand knowledge of all the injustice that happens at a typical Nigerian police cell. From there, after five nights in police cell, I was arraigned in court. And immediately after the court session, officials of the court were coming to me to say if I could pay. They would get my bill documents for me in a few hours, and I would sleep in my house. Meanwhile, the pronouncement of the magistrate was I should be remanded in prison first until I perfected my bill conditions. Which means that typically in the Nigerian justice system, if you have your money, if you know the right people, you have the right connections, you escape justice all the time. Because people come to court session and think, oh, he has been sent to jail. And they go home, not knowing that the accused already paid his way and slept at home that night as though he had committed no offense. From there, I was sent to prison. Uh, 
in prison, my cover was blown after I mean, the cover was blown because they found some device on me. And then they wanted to know if I was a journalist. And I thought if I said I was at that point in time, that was the end of the story. By the way, right there in court, prison officials were coming to me to say if I had money, I would stay in special cells. I would not, they told me point blank, you either serve the prison with your body or with your money, you know? So a lot of things that I saw in, in prison, records of prisoners can be erased if you have the money, which was why in 2020, when some prisoners escaped, uh, I think it was Edo State, they could not put, they couldn't affix the photos of those prisoners, of some prisoners to their names, because the records can be deleted if you, if you pay. You get to sleep in special cells, you, you are in air conditioned cells, you, you can, you, as I speak, you have prisoners who are on Facebook, who are on Twitter, who buy phones from prison warders. So essentially, the summary is that the things I found out were disheartening, and they confirm that if you have money and you know the right people, there is no justice in Nigeria. How come, I'm going to come to the end SARS movement because this is crucial. But before I get to that, I just want to ask a question as a journalist and as a as kind of human being. How confident that if you got into the prison, you'd be able to get out? I mean, it's quite a calculated. I mean, you talk about police brutality and... As an, as an individual, you, you can't be confident. Um, the way prisoners are treated in Nigeria, it's like, like they're all on death row, even though not all of them are. Even if you're an awaiting trial inmate, which is your trial is still going on, you have not been convicted by a court of law, you can die in prison. There was a case two months ago at a prison called Kuje, you know, on the outskirts of the federal capital. Some guy who was suicidal, who was always thinking about the denial of freedom, and because there was power outage, in prison, the guy just went somewhere and he hung himself, you know? And when inmates, when inmates alerted the authorities, they told them, you have to wait till tomorrow morning before anyone can come check up on you. So if you enter a prison cell in Nigeria, there are no probabilities. Anything, anything happens and you are gone. And the authorities can deny your death to release your bodies, they call your relatives and tell them to sign that they're not going to cause any trouble. So essentially, if you, if you get into prison, anything can happen from there so this is this is kind of you using journalism in a way to experience something so you're not reporting on something as an observer you're you're putting yourself in there which has all sorts of implications about what it means to be a journalist in many ways um and the end SARS movement that you referred to is, is, is really interesting. And just to kind of highlight quickly, it's a series of protests that sprung up around Nigeria, protesting against um, police brutality and especially over the special anti-robbery squad, which is the, the SARS. Um, and it was a movement that was a kind of driven by civil society, driven by social media. Could you tell us a little bit about what role journalists played as well in the movement? Uh, before I answer your question, please permit me to tell you that within an hour of coming on to this program, I got two reports of police brutality in Lagos alone. A bus driver whose vehicle broke down, pushed it aside overnight. The police went for the bus. They told it, and now they're asking for 50,000 naira bribe. And then there's some, some one other in Ikeja. So it's an everyday experience for Nigerians that they get brutalized by the police. What role did journalists play? I would say that for the first time, the Nigerian government got, got, got shaken to its foundations because there was international media coverage. A lot of times, credit is given to the young Nigerians who took to the streets to protest. And people often underestimate the importance of the global attention that journalists paid the protest. And it helped to put the Nigerian government in a situation where it thought, look, this is a global crisis. This is a global PR disaster that we have to manage. You know? So for, for essentially for movements, journalists are incredibly important to, to the success or failure. Okay. And which media outlets in particular do you think 
played the most important roles here? And was, was it television? Was it online? Oh, so many. Look, everyone, everyone dug in. CNN, BBC, Reuters, Al Jazeera, New York Times, from all over the world. Everyone was interested and it helped to, it helped massively to put pressure on the government. Nigerian journalists too, you know, journalists were filming, they were, they were writing editorials, opinions. Um, for instance, when the government infiltrated the, the biggest open secret about the NSAS protests that the Nigerian government hired talks to infiltrate the protest grounds and discredit the protesters. But we knew this because journalists were recording. You know, the talks who arrived at the federal capital at some point and were circling and were entering vehicles, waiting to go to the protest grounds, there were videos of them. So journalists played an incredible role, even local journalists, in exposing all the shenanigans that happened during the protests. How, and staying particularly on local journalists and Nigerian outlets, did they feel more able to report this time than they have been able to in, in the past? Because of now, the international attention. Now, in terms of ability to report, it's individual. So you have the journalists who, are, who aspire, who do their best, you know, within the limits of the human weakness to stay on the side of the truth. For those ones, it was hard. The government came down on them. The Nigerian Broadcasting Commission um, fined a number of them, the likes of Channels TV, um, Arise TV, you know, just for instance, for saying there was a massacre at the toll gate on October 20. So the government came down hard on some media houses, on some journalists, on agencies that were seen to have encouraged journalists. There, there, is, there is an organization called Gatefield in Nigeria that provided small funding, 100,000, 50,000, for journalists to cover the protest. The government froze their accounts, you know, and there were journalists contracted by the government to brand everything NSAS as hate speech. Mm -hmm. So in terms of freedom to report, it's the, the general perspective is to look at the security of journalists. But the, the, the ongoing warfare against the truth is more mental than physical. This day, it's mental. You have an army of social media influencers who throng Twitter, Facebook, and brand a lot of things fake news. Of course, fake news was evident during the protest, but then there were government, journalists loyal to government, and influencers, social media influencers that government contracted to come online and continue to defend the position of the government, the position of the police, and continue to attack proponents and supporters of the NSAS protest. Yeah. I'll come to social media and Twitter in particular in a few minutes. I have lots of questions on that. But before that, just two questions from our journalist fellows about your personal safety. A question from Gideon uh, Sapong in Ghana, which is when you, when you went into prison, what risk considerations did you take before going undercover? Did you have an escape plan, literally an escape plan? And have there been any reforms since your investigations? Okay, the risks, I, mean, I knew there was a possibility of death, even though it was minimal. I knew there was a possibility of sodomy. I knew there was a possibility of physical harm. Uh, I knew there was also the possibility of mental damage because if you spend time with people who have truly committed crimes, by the way, there are people in prisons who are innocent, but if you spend time with people who have committed crimes, who are ardent, you know, it, it can't take a mental toll. If, you, if your, your strength or values are not well-founded, you know, you could be exposed to some very quick ways of making money that are, that are impure. So there was that risk. And I had a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. By the way, I said my cover was blown. Um, they eventually found out I was a journalist, but they could not harm me because immediately it happened, we activated plan A. You know, they were still 
trying to organize a room where a meeting would be held to deliberate what should be done with me when they got a call from the controller of prisons at the Federal Capital Territory in Nabuja. Meanwhile, this happened in Lagos. So there was a plan to say if something went wrong, what we are, I don't want to say them here, but there was a plan and we had to activate one of those plans, which is the reason for, for leaving the prison in one piece, despite that my cover was blown at some point. Okay, thank you. And was there a um, final part of that question? Was there, has there been any reforms that you're aware of? Yes, yes. So I, I didn't even get to know early enough. Some of the officers who were caught on tape taking bribes were transferred out of uh, the city to very remote parts of, of different states as some form, form of punishment to, for, for their bad behavior. Um, that's one. I know also that there is some, some level of carefulness on the part of the police and court officials to say, look, we don't know who is watching and um, we have to just be more careful about about who we ask bribes from, how we treat people who are coming in as inmates, because you never know. And um, most importantly, there is a, a high level of consciousness as a result of that story among the public about the problems of the Nigerian justice system. And sometimes when, when we do stories, that instances where we record immediate impact, and there are times when the biggest impact is just the knowledge of the extent of the problem we are dealing with. Because when we know the extent of a problem, we can start thinking of solutions. But if a problem exists and it's not even open to public knowledge, the people, the right people to make the change are not even aware that the mess is that bad. But how do you talk about solving that problem? Thank you. Another very practical question from um, Ton van der Ham, who's an investigative journalist from the Netherlands with us. And when, when he goes undercover, he kind of films all the findings and in your case how did you how did you kind of prove what you saw in prison what would were you recording were you taking notes oh yes i had i had secret filming devices mm -hmm. um i filmed in police Fine. station i filmed in, i filmed in court i filmed in prison the ones that i filmed in prison were were seized from me you know, the, the the device was seized um as a matter of fact the prison went back to tell the police that look, yeah, you are sleeping. Someone came in there and recorded you and, and that's it. But they thought the device they had contained all the recordings, you know? So when I came out, I went back to the ones that I recorded before my cover was blown. So I did have um, some videos from police cell, from the courts showing that some things were wrong that, that shouldn't be if you're talking about justice for people who have been who have been wronged. Okay, thank you. Going going forward now to to this again back to the SARS protest and and the kind of the 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 role of social media here and Twitter has played a huge role in Nigeria not least because it uh, it you know it suspended a tweet from the president, um, you know attacking the civil service without getting you into too much trouble, what do you see as the role of social media in this space, especially Twitter, Facebook, the kind of the US companies? You, you talked already about the influencers and the, and the bots essentially who are kind of paid by government, but it's also been a space where people have been able to organize and, um, and voice dissent. And I was just wondering where you see the balance falling. Yeah, I, I'll say that, I'll say anything without caring if it gets me into trouble or not, you know, as long as it's the truth, it has to be said. You know, we can't all shy away from the truth in the name of we don't want to run into trouble. If, if I say anything and the government wants to arrest, it has to be proven in court. So even if there's an arrest because of something that I've said here, it has to be proven in court. And I'm not going to say anything that I'm not sure of. It's clear that Twitter in particular has been a platform for holding the government to account. By the way, the current regime of President Bama Dubari benefited from Twitter when he was contesting in 2015. He used Twitter as some form of, uh, to push his activism against the government of good luck to happen. So there's nothing happening now that the current administration did not benefit from. Again, even while that benefit is on, 
On the flip side, it exists that the government has a budget for social media appointees who then have a crowd of people who come to the space and push the government agenda. So it's not like it's a space that exists without government participation, without government's ability to influence. No, the government is also, you know, it's also benefiting from that space. The only problem, the only problem was that on October 14, 2020, Jack promoted answers and invited people to donate Bitcoins to the cause. That's the only problem. People talk about the, the tweet of President Obama Dubari that was deleted. That, that's just an afterthought. The real problem was that by that tweet, Jack had effectively thrown his weight behind the protest and it rattled the government. But it's a space that is important, that needs to be preserved because look, when the people do not have a space, an avenue, a platform to vent their discontent with the standard of governance. They are asking for anarchy. If I'm annoyed that I can't tweet, I can't tweet about the things I don't like about this country and move on, then you are telling me to bottle up my anger and go and get a gun, go and get a machete, go and get a knife and, and harm people. Then it's important to have a space for people to vent their anger, to say the things they don't like about, about, about governance and about government. And if the people in government care, if they are indeed in office, in trust for the people, then it's incumbent on them to listen, not to shut down that space. That, that's why it's a democracy. Tell us a little bit about the cyber crimes law in Nigeria. So the, the cyber crimes law is, is something government officials often use to go after journalists that that have written what they don't like. You know, so if 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 you write and it looks like there is pressure on a certain individual, on a certain government, the Nigerian government often you know finds provisions of that law, you know, to arrest uh, to arrest journalists to, to to just lock them lock them away. And the important thing is that government will always the government. Government always holds the ACs. So if government wants to wants to um, persecute any journalist, they always find different provisions uh, of that cyber crimes law to, 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 to arrest journalists. But there's nothing on that law, for instance, that, that prevents people from expressing their opinion from um, from from saying the truth, from 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 speaking facts, and again, the the government itself, even outside the cyber crimes law, the government came up um, a few years ago and say, if you if your pronouncements on social media are deemed as hate speech, then there is a fine for you, a hefty fine, you know. But this is a government that is not interested in fines for underperforming public officials, fines for the real issues triggering those comments. So if I tweet about killings in Kaduna in, 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 in Northern Nigeria, you say it, it, it's speech because I'm criticizing someone. But the problem is that the government has failed to protect the people. So what's the fine for, for that in itself? I mean, it, it, this kind of a step back in the, the, the role, the state of journalism in Nigeria is really fascinating because it's a hugely densely populated country with a vast number of media outlets in every language, every region. How much do you see a sense of public interest journalism? Because from outside, I see some really terrific journalism, really incredible journalism digitally, um, and a lot of legacy media that really sees its role as reporting, you know, chronicling government um, pronouncements in many ways. But I wonder if that's fair. I think that there is a shift in, 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 there's a generational shift in the practice of public interest journalism. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like to think that, that this is in part due to the interest of um, not-for-profit funders in democracy and their understanding that you cannot have a viral democracy without an independent press. So it's been that, it's, it's, 
you don't necessarily have to run after government, have to promote government to survive as an individual. You can get donor funding and you then have a new crop of Nigerian journalists who would rather do that kind of journalism than chase the government. But like you said, for the legacy papers, it's, it, the, the standard is by and large still to cover government activities because that's what they grew up used to. That's what they did for decades. But the times are changing. And I do really think that the future of Nigerian public interest journalism is quite bright. We have a couple of young guys who are new, who are two, three, four years, five years old in the system, and are really bent on holding the government to account. So I think it's even going to get better in the coming years. I mean, donor-funded journalism is interesting. Um, and in many countries, while it produces very, very good journalism, it's often mistrusted by the population for being an outsider's perspective. And, and, and it's something that governments often weaponize. They'll say, you know, this is foreign funded, you know, spying essentially onto our domestic affairs. Um, do you see that in Nigeria and how do you combat that if you're a donor funded outlet? I think the problem is that, the problem is not donor funding. The problem is the independence that it gives journalists to survive outside of corporate Nigeria and the government. The fact that the dependency on government has been whittled down. The fact that there's an alternative that the government, the government would rather be the, 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 for instance, two, three years ago, Punch newspaper wrote a skating advertorial, sorry, a skating editorial, Punch is Nigeria's most widely read newspaper, by the way, about the president and said, look, this, this, this president is going about it as if we're in a, we, we are in a, a military regime. And so we are going to stop referring to this guy as a president, but as a major general, his last um, rank in the army. And government adverts stopped going to the punch, you know? So the, the number of papers that government would typically send adverts to and pay them for, then shrank by one simply because of that editorial. So the real issue is that government would rather, rather maintain that stranglehold on the media so that outside corporate Nigeria and the government, you can't survive. To, 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 the, to the best of my knowledge in terms of the interactions I've had with one or two donors in Nigeria, it's not even about, um, it's not about spying on, on the government. It's not about compromising internal security. It's usually about, we have to empower the people who are working for the public, who are working for truth. We have to strengthen them because every country needs it. Every country needs alternative voices, especially in a country like Nigeria, where, like you said, the population is huge. Um, government, bad government policy can have spiraling effects, you know, on people. The consequences can be massive. Yeah. And we can't enthrone a system where there is no journalistic accountability that the government has to be wary of. What's the trust in Nigeria, do you feel, between the audiences and the media, both with the newer media and the legacy media? So, I think the legacy, among the older generation, the legacy media enjoy more trust, which means that if you read, read a story on an online platform, for instance, and you doubted it, if the legacy paper is reported, you would say, oh, it's now in Punch, it's now in Guardian. So that means it is true. You still have that. And among the younger population, the legacy media, um, legacy newspaper houses are seen as seen, I'm choosing my words carefully, as seen as more corrupt than the new guys, as seen as more loyal to the old order. You know, meanwhile, online platforms, new media are seen as those who are more likely to give you the news just as it is, even if the government doesn't like it. So it's seen that if you want independent news that is not, uh, that hasn't been filtered, by government influence, you would find that on, on social media. But generally speaking, if you if you want to confirm if your story is true, then you should go to legacy platforms. Okay, so it is interesting. So the 
the sense is still that the legacy media has to carries the weight, even though yeah. possibly don't investigate it or criticize us heavily if it's the newer ones. Yeah. Um, what was it like? I mean, Twitter was banned for a few days this autumn in Nigeria, and you talked about um, the the kind of the bad actors on Twitter. And I'm wondering a question from Mark Alou, a former journalist fellow from Kenya as well. Was there an upside to the Twitter ban? Was there? Did you have a sense that you were being and independent journalists were being less harassed on Twitter, or was there a sense of calm? Was there any upside? Yes, sense of calm in the sense that it was an official government policy for you not to use Twitter. So imagine that the known government supporters on Twitter could not use it. The official government spokesman could not use it. So the, the shady things they do in terms of um, um, obfuscating the truth, they didn't do it by sending their full soldiers. So the main guys are not active any longer. But I would, I would, I would rather have the original system. Look, plurality of opinions is part of the, the foundations of democracy. That you trying to stifle the truth and you trying to enthrone the truth, you both have access to the same space and then leave the public to judge. So I won't sit down there and say, oh, because I can tweet now and um, Itolu Ogulis is not going to come after me. I mean, all the, the known government spokesmen are not going to come after me. And then I say, I, I like it. To, to, to say that would mean to contradict myself when I say it's a space that should be open to everyone. So I'd rather have what we used to, to have pre-June where everyone could talk and then the public will make up their minds. That's true. Thank you very much. Um, two questions just from my journalist fellows. I'm looking down at my phone where they're sending me questions via WhatsApp. Um, the, on the cybercrime law, going back to the cybercrime law, could you give specific examples of what you referred to about instances where it was used against journalists? And um, what measures would you recommend would be effective against hate speech? Again, you've talked about things being misused, but what do you think would be effective? Okay. An example is that of a journalist called Agba Jalingo, mm -hmm. who reported about the diversion of funds by the state governor, by the governor of a state called uh, Cross River. Diversion of funds meant for uh, the Cross River State Microfinance Bank. And uh, was arrested, the government cooked up a list of crimes against him. And one of them was can't, I can't remember precisely, but I know that they cited the cyber crimes law as part of the list of um, charges that were brought up against them. But there, there was nothing in it. The governor only needed to prove that the story was wrong if it was, and he couldn't do it. That's one example. Um, then the second question. Um, hate speech. What, yes, hate speech. What, what do you think would be effective tools for ending or lessening hate speech? The most important, the most important is quality governance. You know, as long as the people are angry with their country, you can't expressly control how they express that anger. Some are going to do it in refined ways because of their background, because of their upbringing, because of their environment, yes. Others are just going to to want to blow everything all up. Do people have a reason to be angry? Yes. We have in Nigeria today where people can't travel interstate four or five hours without fearing for their lives. I used to drive from Lagos to Abuja. I, I lived in Abuja for a year. And in that day, I drove like five times from, from Lagos to Abuja. I can't try that now. I can't, I can't try that. It's not safe. You have kidnappings everywhere, you know, robbery. The economy is, is poor. The Naira continues to weaken against the dollar. The spending power of the people continues to reduce. And you want them to be happy. You know, as long as the government has given the people that loophole, to cultivate their anger, you are not going to have precise control over how it's done. The solution is to 
give people quality leadership. If I, if I was busy, gainfully employed, I'm not going to have time to be following Unam Dekano and what he's saying and be writing, you know, offensive tweets against my country. But if I'm jobless, if I'm not protected, someone is selling an alternative to me, whether it's right or wrong, I'm going to think about it because I'm sure that what this, this system I'm inside now is not for me. We just have a few people who are holding the country by the jugular. If you do a study of Nigerian public office holders, you'll find that, that the current governor is either the son or grandson of someone who was government decades ago. You know, the current minister, the, you have people in, people in the high place. It's just a network of very small people. And the rest of the public are angry. It looks like this Nigeria is a concept that serves, that benefits the interest of just a few. So what's going to be left for the rest of us? And that's why the people are angry. You know, those who keep saying things that the government considers hate speech only say them because they are angry with the quality of leadership that they are getting. And if the government will be alive to its responsibility, they're going to see a drastic drop in hate speech. Thank you. Thanks very much. Really, really um, important answer there. Um, going back to journalism in particular, there's two questions, one from Dolapa Ena, who's kind of countryman. Um, what's the, what do you see as the future of journalism in Nigeria? And then, then a question from Meraj Lone, an Indian journalist from Kashmir, is which is what is the Nigerian journalist community doing to push back against the abuses that, you, that you've highlighted, the kind of legal abuses and the corruption and the kind of suppression of press freedom and independent reporting? The future of journalism is, I'll say, technically in the hands of people outside journalism. Okay. Not, not even people within. If people are going to, and I, I, as I said, that consciousness is rising. If people in law, in business, in, in, in the donor space are going to see journalism as crucial to the survival of this country, then it's just going to get better. And I think it will also because of the, 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 the pureness of the mind of the young people who are entering this industry. You have really young people coming in and wanting to hold the government to account, not just, not just come into the space to frolic with people in power, to ingratiate themselves with people in power, to have connections, to be connected, to, 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 to know the high and mighty. You have young people who, to the, to, to the outside world, to the public, are not that known, but they are really interested in using this profession as a platform for building this country. Because if you have a country where the truth prevails, where the politicians don't have it so easy, to steal money, to trample on people, to distort the truth. If you have that kind of country, um, the dem democracy is better served. So I, I think the future is really bright, but that the extent of brightness will be determined by how much of interest people outside journalism show in its survival. Thank you very much. And then the next part of that question, which is what are journalists themselves doing to push back against um, attacks on them, attacks on their industry? For a number of media houses, the strategy is to be compliant. We don't want the trouble of government. If government says don't use massacre, don't, don't use massacre, even if that's what happened. Um, so you have journalists and media houses in that group. Let's not, we are not here to ruffle the feathers of government. We just do as they say with minimal, the, um, minimal angst in, in government cases. And then, you have, and that's where you have majority, but you have a few who are saying, regardless of all antics of the government, the truth has to be reported. Um, the journalism associations are shaking in their responsibilities. Uh, the Nigerian Guild of Editors, the Nigerian Union of Journalists, and it is impossible for them because traditionally these are 
organizations, there are media establishments that are always chummy with the government of the day. So you cannot be frolicking with government and then be in a position to properly hold the government to account for uh, the shrinking of, of the media space. Thank you. And what, what help do you need from the international community? There's two questions here. Firstly, um, what support can be given by the international community? And the second question from Alex Murray from the BBC, which is, what do you think the role of international news organisations in particular should be in supporting and reporting on sol in solidarity with Nigerian journalists? And is it better to amplify existing reporting or to replicate it? And the danger of replicating it for the SARS protests, for example, is that it, it, it excludes or drowns out the Nigerian voices? Okay, so first question, let me answer the second first because I, 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 I remember it straight off. What can be done? I think that, for instance, the NSAS protest offered an example of how quickly, how quickly in-country results can happen if there is international coverage. I'll just say, international newspapers should show more interest in Nigeria, should show more interest in what is happening, should commission more independent stories on what's happening in Nigeria, should give Nigeria more, more visibility in, in, in their papers. Because at the end of the day, fact is that the Nigerian government respects the international media more for obvious reasons. For instance, this, the minister, information minister was talking about the reports yesterday and was saying CNN and other newspapers, CNN and other newspapers, just because CNN did a, a hard eating story about what happened on the night of October 2020. So I think that the basic things international platforms can do is to give more attention to the coverage of Nigeria, to investigative journalism in Nigeria, you know, not just the daily news reporting, but also in digging, you know, commission their journalists to give them more time. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fine balance between regular production of stories and the in-depth investigations that take more time, you know, and also collaborate more with, with journalists that are not affiliated with them, but are doing critical stuff. I, I would be very open to doing stuff like this with, with international platforms because no matter how solid your work is as a Nigerian journalist, uh, it's, it's, there's more government attention if it's published by an international, the same report that you publish in a Nigerian paper gets government attention, but it's different if exactly it's that same story gets published by CNN, by Reuters, by Al Jazeera, by an AP or AFP, the government always is more interested in its international image. So that's one. Two, what do I need? So I, I, I wanted to get it, what do I need personally or what do I think journalists need? Both. Here's your chance. Both. Both. So what do I need? Okay, let me go with, with the public first. From the international media, it's... Um, Maybe I can't speak for what, what, what my colleagues need. Maybe I can speak for myself. What I need is always an opportunity to get out if I run into trouble. When I say get out, I mean get out momentarily. There's trouble, how can I just get out for a week? And then come back. I always want to be in Nigeria. I always want to live in Nigeria. My work is needed here in Nigeria, I don't have ambitions of relocating abroad. I don't have ambitions of living in the US or whatever, but I do know that it's important for you to have instant opportunity to be able to leave if required and then come back quietly and continue your work. For instance, <clears throat> excuse me, after my prison story, there was a meeting at Nigerian Immigration um, Headquarters. And they were talked about arresting me and using um, some provisions of the law to, you know, to, to get me to say that I was communicating with, with inmates, which is a breach of the laws. And then they were going to arrest me until a social media movement, keep Fisayosif, hashtag keep Fisayosif, started and forced the hands of the government to release a statement. They released a statement saying, oh, you're not going after this journalist, it's not true. 
we want to work hand in hand with him to see if the things he stated in the story are true and we can work together. More than two years now, no one from government has contacted me. So it's clear, you know, it was a statement that was released just out of, out of that pressure. So it can happen. I had to go underground for roughly two weeks, you know, but it can happen that you are in trouble for a story you've done that the government does not like. Who can you pick your phone and call? And you can get out as quickly as, as possible. I think that's what is, uh, what is most important to me. Again, that kind of, and also who are the people that if that were to happen to me, who are the people that will speak for me? If DSS were to pick me up today, who are the people internationally who would speak for me? When, when uh, Omar Elisho, the publisher of uh, Sahara Reporters, was arrested by the government because it was, he convened a, a protest revolution now, you know, and he was detained. It took the US legislature speaking out for the government to then, to, then, to then release him and allow the trial to continue as normally as it should. So it's, it's even for them, for the people in government who don't like the critical journalism, one of the considerations before they take on any journalist is what kind of backing does he have? If he picked this guy up, what kind of international embarrassment are we going to suffer? What kind of national outrage are we going to suffer? If it looks like, oh, no, man, there's nothing, they go ahead. And if, if it feels, look, this is going to be a lot of trouble. This is going to be in Reuters, it's going to be in BBC, it's going to be in CNN, CPG is going to be talking, uh, Reporters Without Borders is going to be talking. This is, this is going to be massive. And then there's, there's more caution. It's good to know those organizations have such a direct impact. Um, you talked about the social media movement, the Keep For Sale Free. Who, where, where did that start from? Your supporters, your friends from outside the country, inside the country? I started from Nigeria, from the likes of uh, someone called uh, the Great Oracle on Twitter. Mm -hmm. He's a Nigerian, a, a quite popular Nigerian lawyer on Twitter who happened on the information and tweeted that I had to run. And then other people picked it up. And uh, I, I can't say exactly who, who conceived that hashtag, but I picked it up and the hashtag started. So it started in country. Thank you. So in country, and it's, did it grow internationally as well? No, no, no it didn't. It didn't. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Nigeria's elections coming up next year, and then, you know, we're the country is really at a moment of kind of another level of democratic debate in in so many ways. I'm just interested to know what you think about the outlook for democratic change in Nigeria in 2023 up to 2024, because there are so many secessionist movements springing up at the moment, so many protests. And what's going on? I'll say gloomy outlook. And I'm not talking about the, the possibility of a split, you know, based on what, what, what the likes of IPOP, that's the indigenous people of uh, Biafra and the uh, Udua nation are saying. I don't think Nigeria is going to break up. I think Nigeria is such a complex country that when it looks like all hope is lost, you just find something still binding us together. And that's why we are the, one of the happiest people in the world, despite all our problems, you know, but, in terms of change, now we have two ruling parties that have both been tried and tested and have failed. Change is not going to happen in Nigeria until we find a leader who is not just brilliant, but has a conscience for the people. And it's not going to happen in those two parties. People of conscience in those two parties are never going to get the opportunity to be president in 2023 or maybe in 2027. So where is that alternative, alternate voice coming from? Whoever wants to displace a Buhari or a Tinubu today should already be actively in our faces by now. And we don't have anything like that, which was a problem we faced in 2015. You had the people who offer themselves as the alternative to PDP and APC came up just a few months to the election. Nigeria is such a big state, 36 states. How many states are you going to cover in that time? So frankly speaking, 
anyone thinking about sound democratic change via the ballot in Nigeria should be talking 2027. I honestly feel 2023 is a lost cause because the next president is going to emerge from either the PDP, the party that ruled for so long, that stole from the people for so much and we, for so long and with impunity. And then we have an APC that promised us a clean Nigeria without corruption, but has not been able to deliver it. That promised to stem the tide of Boko Haram attacks. Yeah, a lot of progress in that, but other groups have sprung up and Nigeria is still insecure. Two parties that have both had their fair share of the presidency and have both failed Nigerians. And one of them, will be in power in 2023 and will be led by one of the main actors of the situation we found ourselves in. The, the people who will be, or the person who will be president in 2023 is still one of the people who have been around for so long, people who contested in the past, you know, there's no breath of fresh air, either with, from within those parties or from outside. So when Nigerians talk about get your PVC, vote APC out, it's still like choosing between the devil and the deep blue sea. And none of them is palatable. Again, going back to journalism and the quality of political journalism in Nigeria, because often you have this kind of scenario that you describe because journalists have themselves framed the political narrative in such a way that there's only space for two two parties, often two established parties to fight it out. And the newer movements or the newer personalities um, don't get don't get airtime. Air so never they were not, not going to be in your face in this way. Do you think that's fair in Nigeria or do you think journalists? I don't think that's the problem. I don't think it's the media. It's not the job of the media to popularize candidates. You know, people want to report this, people want to report what it is. It's the job of the candidates to make themselves visible. The problem is usually that they do it at the last minute. They do it without, the, without solving the funding problem. And it's because the, the intellectual class, and this is often a problem with the intellectual class. It's not only about the greatness of those ideas. It's not only about the sincerity of purpose. You have to ask yourself one critical question. What will it take? The, 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 the voters in Nigeria, the voting population comprises largely of artisans. The, the middle class and upper, they don't often vote. They speak grammar on Twitter and Facebook and run away. The welders, the vulcanizers, the shoemakers, the bus conductors, bus drivers, gatekeepers, those are the people who come out to vote. But those are not people that we know you by reading about you in New York Times or in Punch or the Guardian. So you have to ask yourself, what will it cost me? to go to the hinterland, to go to the villages, to go to those, what will it cost me to take myself there? It's a lot of money. You first have to find the solution for that. You first have to solve the money problem. You have to ask yourself, the person who became president in, 2020, in 2019, how much did he spend? The one who became president in 2019, how much did he spend? And what is my funding plan? You want to become president in 2023, you probably should have spent the last three years trying to solve the funding problem. And then you are coming out and you can go around. But when you come out, the alternative voices, one year to 2019 election, they didn't even know the parties on which platform they would be contested. And people vote parties, not individuals. Party symbols and you compete against the party symbols. But one year to an election, you don't even know the party you are running on and you want to win. So it's not enough to come up with that sincerity of purpose, the grandness of idea. You also have to be ready to do the dirty work. And the dirty work is to take yourself to those places where people are going to vote. So you need time for that and you need money for that. If you can't solve those two problems, then you can't blame the media. To open up this very direct conversation, we have um, Kingsley Chidi Mokalu, um, a political economist who's 
running for president, I think in 2023, speaking at Oxford tonight at the Martin School. And there's a question from Fikayo Akeredolu Ake, Ake from Steers Business saying, what advice would you give him if you had any? Kingsley Morgalu, hmm. first, he has to solve the funding problem. A former CBN deputy director, he's not likely to have made the money to campaign nationwide. He first has to look for people who believe in him nationally and internationally, who will solve that funding problem. But a model that the intellectual class recognizes because they read him, because they see the clarity of his thoughts, is not going to win the 2023 election. If the Hausa man in Kanu, in Kaduna, who does not understand English, does not meet with him physically at the protest ground, at the town hall meeting, wherever. So it's not enough to be brilliant, to have international connections, the funding, and, and I suspect that for people like him, that the funding problem first has to be solved because Nigeria is such a big country and you are not going to cover it in so short a time without, uh, the people you are contesting against, the watches that they have, we're talking about ruling parties. We're talking about people who, quite frankly, have stolen a lot of money over the years. So you can't steal money like them because, I mean, you're supposed to be the alternative voice. And even if you wanted to, you don't have political power yet. And so you have to go and look for that clean source. It's important. I say it all the time. Anybody who has not solved the funding problem and is serious about winning, has no business contesting, you know. I would rather a Kingsley Mogalu, if he hasn't solved the problem, I would rather he stays away from 2023 election, uses the next, and use the next four years to build the funding base and show up in 2027, you know. I mean, worst case scenario, a few days to elections, you find Nigerian politicians who buy bags of rice and that they brand it in their name, you give it to the poor and uneducated. We can sit here and talk about, oh, what does the future of Nigeria look like? Look like? What's the future of journalism? What's going to happen to democracy, freedom of speech, uh, shrinking media space? They don't understand all this. The man who has not gone to school does not understand the meaning of media space, does not understand the meaning of accountability, does not understand cyber law, but he sees a bag of rights. Now he's going to vote. You can't blame him. You can't blame him. You can't ask of people what you haven't given them. People who are poor and hungry and uneducated are not in a position to make conscientious decisions. But they are going to vote for those guys. For those who will give them the bag of rights. Now you have to give them that bag of rights too. You have to, and I'm not talking about vote, vote buying. It, it's the reality. Among the people who can reason along the lines of the possibility of your campaign, you don't need to. But the people who are broke and hungry and poor and don't know where the next meal is going to come from, they're not going to listen to your ideas. And you're going to need money to get people like that on your side. Great. Thank you so much. So this has been... We'll make sure that message gets to him. Um, but thank you so much for spending this hour with us as well. It's been really terrific to speak to you. And your reporting is extraordinary. I recommend everyone looks up your, your reporting. You won the Kurt Schalk Awards um, as well this year for your work. And we're going to stay on the theme of investigative journalism next week. Um, we're speaking to three reporters who worked on the Pandora Papers. Um, Will Fitzgibbon from I ICIJ. Elisa Lopez from Manila's Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, and Omar Chima, the Pakistan investigative reporter at the News International Pakistan, to talk about this other extraordinary cross-border collaboration. And so do join us then. But in the meantime, Fusayo, thank you so much for your time again and safe reporting. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank yeah. you. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you to all the participants. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everyone.